Good morning, friends. Steve from Southern Illinois again. Still beautiful and green in spring here. Rain seems to have stopped, but um, the heat hasn't begun. So, <clears throat> I hope you are having joy in your life as well. The day my son and I climbed Jerry Peak in Nigeria is one I'll never forget, and I don't think he will either. It was December in West Africa, that's known as Harmattan. Dry, desiccating winds blow south off of the Sahara during that time of year and bring with them clouds of dust. <clears throat> Vivian had to <clears throat> dust two or three times a day. Uh, we had to dust right before we set the table. And you didn't wait very long after you set the table before you ate because dust would accumulate on the plates. So the sky was a kind of a brownish haze uh, as we were setting out. Nights were are cool during that time of the year, but during the daytime, uh, temperatures are more unpredictable. They can rise, be down in the 40s, or they can rise up into the 80s. Kind of like our springtime here, except that it's dry and brown. Now, Jerry Peak towered about a thousand feet over the village where we were living, over our home. And from the first day that we had arrived, it had caught my son's attention. Um, he just could, was obsessed with what was seeing on what was what he could see from the top. Work, illness, other engagements had prevented us from from going, and we had less than three weeks before we were going to return here to the United States. So. It was a big deal that day when we set out for Jerry Peak. We left about noon, and I'd estimated that it was about hmm, five-hour hike there and back. It was easy terrain, uh, appeared to be easy terrain, and we didn't expect any problems. We were taking water with us, but really not any other equipment. We would be be home before supper and and uh, before sundown. Two hours later we reached the summit. Everything was going fine until we were just a few yards from the summit when suddenly I doubled over with pain in my belly and I spent the next two hours vomiting and groaning and rolling on the ground. Eric wasn't sure I was going to live or die, and neither was I, because um, it was my first experience of a gallbladder attack. And if you want an extreme experience, let me recommend that you have your first gallbladder attack on top of a mountain in the African bush with no roads available and uh, no way of communicating. It'll get your heart pumping, let me tell you. But that's not the story. <clears throat> By the time the pain and vomiting had subsided, the sun was hanging low on the horizon. There was no way we were going to get home before dark. Eric asked a very reasonable question. Dad? How are we going to find our way off this mountain in the dark? We had brought no flashlights. Now I would love to tell you that I prayed and a spotlight from heaven appeared and all we had to do was walk in that circle of light down the mountainside. Believe me, we prayed but no light appeared. 
No heavenly guide materialized. Nobody stepped out of the bush and said, follow me. We were left apparently alone to find our way home. Two problems immediately presented themselves to me. To me. How do we maintain our sense of direction in the dark? And how do we identify danger? How do we locate obstacles, rocks, trees, the odd cliff or two, you know? Looking up, I saw the evening star hanging on the horizon. It was directly above our home. So I pointed it out to Eric. I said, see that star? We're going to follow that star home. If we keep walking towards that star, we'll be walking towards home. And I told him, my, I'm feeling better, but I don't know if this pain is going to come back. Because I, so I want you to know how to get home. If an obstacle comes into your way, or you can't go forward, just move to the side until you're clear of the obstacle, and then keep walking towards the star. The star is home. If you lose sight of the star, if, if a cliff or a tree or a cloud gets in the way, depending on the circumstances, either pause and wait for the obstacle to move, or move to the side until it no longer blocks your vision. Keep your eyes on the star. Then in the gathering gloom, we looked around until we found some sturdy sticks. Not walking sticks. Tapping sticks. Mine was about 12 feet long because I wanted to be able to test when we found that there was no ground in front of us with our tapping. I wanted to be te able to test, is this a cliff or is this a, just a little one foot drop off? And that was our equipment for getting off of the mountain. Now, we could have just bedded down for the night. Temperatures would only drop down into the 40s and we probably would have survived. But somehow that didn't seem to be the appropriate response. And now we had a plan, okay? Our destination was home. Our direction was following the star. That would get us home. And our way of recognizing danger was our sticks. And so thus equipped, we started down the mountainside. There was still enough light to see our way down the first precipice that we came to. But after that, there was no moon to begin with, and we were like two blind men. Tap, 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 tap. Tapping our way down the mountainside. Following the star whenever we could see it. Time and again we came to obstacles a drop-off with no discernible way down. We would carefully tap our way to one side or to the other and every time a path opened up. Sometimes we ran into a cliff that blocked our view of the star and prevented us from going forward. Eric would call out to me, Dad, what do we do now? Stick to the plan, Eric. Stick to the plan. So we would start tapping our way one side or the other. And once the obstacle was cleared and once we could see the star, we started our one away home. By the time we reached the flatness of the valley, the moon had come up. It wasn't a full moon, but it was a moon. And the Harmattan haze had dissipated and the stars were brilliant 
and to our eyes in the dark after tapping our way down the mountain it was as bright as noonday sun the trail was clearly visible to us we didn't throw away our sticks we just drug them in front of us to make sure no snakes were there but we were on our way home Today's touchstone is that star on the horizon. Lesson four in the series that we're studying at the church on principles of a spiritual life um, is titled, A Plan for Your Life. And the idea is that God has a plan for your life. Now, I would love to tell you that his plan comes with a GPS navigational system that tells you exactly where you are exactly when to turn, uh, exactly how long it's going to take for you to get where you're going, and that lets you choose the destination. Um, I would love to tell you even more that if you follow it, nothing painful or sad or tear your heart out, make you want to give up and die will ever happen to you. But you and I both know that that's not reality. We would all like turn-by-turn -turn instructions in our lives. We would all like someone to tell us how to make sure nothing bad will ever happen. Even if we don't listen to them most of the time, we would like someone giving us turn-by-turn -turn instructions. But we all have enough experience in life to know that that doesn't happen. No human can give us what we want. And God didn't promise us that. But that doesn't mean that he doesn't have a plan. His plan is just real. It's full contact, total engagement. Bugs in my face. Meet life head on kind of plan that doesn't pull any punches with the harsh realities of life. It comes in three parts. The people in the Bible were clear about their destination, home. On earth, there will be, it's an earth that where there will be no tears, no sorrow, no suffering, no death. Even though in the Old Testament, resurrection and hope for eternal life is a minor component they still had that hope in the here and now they that the future was going to be better things were God was going to come through for them no matter what obstacles they encountered sickness abuse injustice catastrophe whatever it was they knew that the future held something better they also had a direction finder a star on the horizon, if you will. Jesus, when he was talking to people, called them to follow him. But he also said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Paul, in his commentary later, tells us that Jesus was the lawgiver on Mount Sinai. The law of the Old Testament was given by Jesus. They are his commandments. The lawgiver of Mount Sinai is the same one who calls us to follow him and who says, if you love me, keep my commandments. <clears throat> Maybe that explains why he went to such pains to explain them. He summed them up in two what I call prime directives. The first directive, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. And the second, love your neighbor like you love yourself. And Jesus said those sum up, they do not replace, they simply sum up all the law and the prophets. It's simple. God's plan for our lives is that for us to follow his instructions. 
to live according to the directions that he gave us. And sometimes we lose sight of that star. We can't see it. Okay, what does God want me to do now, here in this situation? And we get upset because he's not telling me what to do. We want that GPS system. We wonder if we're headed in the right direction. There will be days when the obstacles you face, I face, we face, seem insurmountable, unstoppable, unending. And life seems muddled and uncertain, purposeless, meaningless. We can't see the star on the horizon. But that is not being lost. We're only lost when the star is in plain sight and we ignore it. And the third part of God's plan, detecting danger, well, that's a topic for another story, another day. This touchstone asks us two questions. What's your destination? Do you have one? And how, what is the star on your horizon? What gives you direction in your life day by day? For the men and women in the Bible, the answers to these two questions were usually clear. They knew what their destination was. And they knew who they were following and what he wanted from them. So I would like to ask those of you who are seeking a meaningful life without religion those two questions. What's your destination in life? Where is the trajectory of your, trajectory of your life taking you? Is that clear? And what star are you following? What guides you through your day-to-day -day life? In my experience, Christianity, as evidenced in studying the Bible for myself, brought a clarity of purpose and direction that I didn't find elsewhere. You might find that too, if you make it your own. And Christians, you say you know your destination. Good. But when was the last time you looked at the star on the horizon? We don't like to talk about the law when it comes to applying it to our own lives. We call that legalism. But bring up the topics of abortion, rainbow rights, banning the Ten Commandments, and the law is front and center. Could it be that we misunderstand why Jesus gave the law to begin with? Why he went to such great pains to explain it, to enlighten us to its meaning and the depth to which he intended it to change our lives? If we did, maybe we would spend less time condemning sinners and more time befriending them, eating with them, drinking with them, socializing with them like Jesus did, being genuine friends. Maybe we would spend more time studying and putting into action the commandments he's given us. So today I would suggest that you open your Bibles. Turn to Exodus chapter 20 and read verses 1 through 21, which is the first summary of God's instructions for our lives. Then turn over to Matthew, chapter 5, start with verse 21, and read the rest of the chapter. This is Jesus' commentary 
on the depth of transformation that he calls us to be committed to, what keeping the law really means, you will find that there is nothing legalistic about it. But boy, does it test our hearts. Meditate on those words. Start following the star. Be safe, my friends. Be prudent. I am happy to say that we have not seen a case of COVID this week in our hospitals. Maybe there's hope for India as well. But that doesn't mean we can stop being prudent. COVID has not disappeared from this world. And through it all, keep looking up. Watch that star on the horizon. Have a good week, and I'll see you again.